So what happens when a VFR airplane flies through some of the busiest military airspace in the country and they're not talking to air traffic control? Traffic, one o'clock, uh, one three miles eastbound up to indicate 4,500. We're not talking to him. Uh, it looks like you're going to meet him about uh, about 10 mile final. Yeah, there's one. I can't see this guy until you guys show us 4,500. Leave it one. Uh, Roger. Contact arrival with channel 7. So that's a perfect example where there's a VFR traffic that's not talking to anyone, and now it's a traffic conflict for us. Leave it one for the 47,500 inbound initial one five flight. So one o'clock, eight miles eastbound out to indicate 4,500. Yeah, uh, because when you get this guy on Tika, so all goodness is sent to 5,500. Beavis 1, roger. So now we're doing all the deconfliction from him, so he increases our workload. Beavis 1, proceed direct point, Bravo, that'll keep you away from that 45 target. I promise we didn't plan for uh, this type of thing to happen, just to show you. is exactly what we were talking about. I see him on there. Yeah, and I mean, you know, we can handle it, uh, but it's not ideal. And they almost had to reroute us, uh, which causes more gas. You can see that we're all pretty close to our bingo fuel. And all it would have taken is just right, a, 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 a simple flight following. I see him over there. <laughs> it's not even that uh, we necessarily want him to alter his profile either. It's just, it's just really nice to be in contact with folks. A flight of four T-38s flying at over 300 knots nearing bingo fuel on the way back from a demanding training mission had to deviate their flight path due to a VFR aircraft not in contact with ATC. I traveled to Shepard Air Force Base in Wichita Falls, Texas, to spend time with the United States Air Force and NGEPT. My goal was to learn about how the Air Force approaches aviation safety and what are those best military aviation safety practices that we in general aviation can adopt as well. The Air Force was kind enough to let me spend time on base, gathering information for this video, and to answer any questions that I had about how to improve aviation safety. And after rigorous systems and egress training, equipment fitting, and a medical exam, I was allowed to fly in the back seat of a T-38 Talon on a real training mission. And it's our turn. Let's go flying. Yes, sir. The jet I was in was piloted by Major Zachary Helton, call sign switch. Major Helton is the chief of safety of the 80th Flying Training Wing at Shepard Air Force Base. So I'm Major Zach Helton. I go by Switch here at uh, Shepard Air Force Base. I'm the Wing Chief of Safety. So we're responsible for safe operations of our incredibly complex and busy uh, flying schedule um, here at NJEPT, uh, which stands for Euro-NATO Joint Jet Pilot Training. We uh, train NATO's fighter pilots. Safety is obviously our, our top priority here at NJEPT. You know, that is what ensures us the, the mission success uh, and personnel protection on every flight. This happens fairly frequently here, unfortunately, at Shepard. Uh, is we will have a general aviation aircraft uh, that will be flying VFR. They have every right to fly right through our MOA, even if we're operating in it. But I think the, the smart pilot has a few options available to them, some of those being uh, either using flight following. And for those new general aviation pilots, first, let's quickly talk about what is VFR flight following. Basically, it's a service where ATC keeps an eye on you while you are flying. It's that simple. ATC provides traffic advisories and alerts to you of other aircraft in the area that might be a conflict. It's such a, uh, an awesome tool that we have uh, with just the basic technology of a radio. We have eyes and ears out and we're using all our available resources to look out for you. But the number one thing uh, that you can do is to get in contact with someone that knows where you are and that knows where we are. Again, you're not required to use it, but it's a free tool and it at least gives you the essay that we're there, it gives us the essay that you're there, and so that we can safely operate around each other and enjoy aviation the way that we all do. Flight falling isn't just for the pilot getting flight falling. Flight falling is the benefit of everyone utilizing the national airspace system, including our military pilots. A common misconception is that uh, I think most people assume that all military aircraft, especially fighter type aircraft uh, like the T-38, have a radar, and that's unfortunately false. Uh, there is not a single aircraft here assigned at Shepard in the NJEP program that has a radar on it. We rely on the same types of tools that uh, GA uh, aviation folks do, such as using our eyeballs, using ADSB, TCAS. Yeah, I've, I've spoken with many air traffic controllers, and uh, they want you to use it because that now allows them to talk to you if they assess that there may be a traffic conflict rather than trying to call you on guard 
uh, or having to significantly alter the flight plan of another aircraft out there or formation, you can be more working together with that other aircraft to mitigate the conflict. And here's a pro tip I learned from the Opposing Bases podcast. When you call ATC, ask for flight following in this order. Your call sign, your current location, your destination, your type of airplane, and your altitude. Many ATC facilities type your request into their system in that order. ATC will be very happy that you've made a very efficient radio request and cut back on the transmissions back and forth between you and them. If you like this content, I'd really appreciate a like and a share and a subscribe. And feel free to give a shout out to Major Helton and everyone at the Air Force who made this content possible in the comments below. Thanks. I'm sure you want to see more T-38 footage. Let's take a look at some of the highlights from the startup, taxi, and takeoff before we get to the next safety lesson. Left generator is off with a good crossover. And now we'll just check for the light to come on at a liter of liquid oxygen, which it does. Which means we got a good jet. Beavis check. Two, three, four. Brown, good afternoon. Beavis 1, Flutter 4, Texas Charlie. Beavis 1, Shepard Ground, Army 1-5 Center, Taxi via Kilo Lima. Beavis 1, Texas 1-5 Center, Kilo Lima. Alright, let's get out of here. All right, Nathan, go ahead and uh, start working on your pins for me. Right. Two pins out and stowed. Copy that. I got two pins removed and stowed. Everybody will do their pre-takeoff checks, and then we should be ready to go. And as fighter pilots, we really like to just keep the little things perfect. So right now we're trying to really line up as much as we can and line with each other. Is got all those wheels and nuggets all the same. Okay. Figure if we can do the little things good, we can do the big things good. All right, my flight controls are free and correct. Nathan, I'm going to have you take the flight controls. I want you to give the stick a nice stir. You have the aircraft. I have the aircraft. Free and correct. All right, I've got the aircraft. Your flight controls are free and correct. The autumn is on. The trim's in the green. Total gates engaged. Speed brake centered and up. I got flap 60. My battery's on. Ciao, good afternoon. Be with one flight of four, number one, one five, seven, all rolling. Be with one Shepard Tower, Roman 157, 1907, clip take off, change the clutch. Be with one, 157, clip take off. Alright, let's put our canopies, Nathan. All the way down and push all the way forward. Alright, canopies closed, lock, the lights out, I got a good bump check. My seat is hot, check your seat hot. Seat is armed. Alright, seat's armed, good. We are ready to go. And it's our turn, let's go flying. Yes sir. All right, we got two good motors. ABs are swinging in. And the instruments all look good. There's Max. Let's go airborne. Gear up, lights out, flaps are up. Still an AB passing through 230. There's 250, we'll pull the motors out of AB. Now we're gonna accelerate to 300. Okay, let's check. Two, three, four. Departure, good afternoon. Beavis 1, flight of 4, passing 3,500. Beavis 1, Shepard Park, try down. So now we're just watching the aircraft in front of us to keep sight of them while trying to hold about 300 knots. Radar contact, 10 miles south east, switch off, falls, vortex. Number 1 and 2 are going to do an in place 90 turn in front of us when you hear a zipper click. So now we're going to go. Okay. What we're trying to do is we're trying to just kind of thread the needle right between 1 and 2 right now. On to our next safety lesson, emergencies. There was a time when I was in a room where the flights are being dispatched and you could also hear higher priority radio calls. I heard that a pilot declared an emergency and when I asked Major Helton about that and the philosophy on when to declare an emergency. Here at Shepard, uh, and this is true across the entire military flying enterprise as a whole, we tend to lean extremely conservative. So whether it's something that you know I may think is relatively benign as it's happening, if a system's not functioning on an aircraft, 
the way that it's supposed to. I have no idea whether that's going to get worse, better, or stay the same. Uh, so we tend to, to declare the emergency when necessary. But we have a pretty solid decision matrix, if you will, that allows us to make the decision appropriately. That we take the conservative route, and we, we do tend to declare the in-flight emergency uh, when it's necessary to, to preserve life. Giving yourself the best chance to have the respective agencies in place, whether that's emergency response, fire department, AMR, anything like that, um, so that in the event that something bad does happen, uh, they're there ready to respond. And at the end of the day, the most important part when, when those situations happen is to get the aircraft on the ground safely uh, to protect, most importantly, that, that individual or that crew's life. That lesson around emergencies was a huge takeaway for me as a GA pilot. And this really clears something up right away. The philosophy of the military, and it should be of us GA pilots, if you ever have a problem when flying, declaring an emergency... It's not just okay, it's absolutely the right thing to do. There's a common myth out there that if a pilot declares an emergency, they're going to get in trouble or face some sort of punishment from the FAA. That's simply not true. All the FAA cares about, way more than any paperwork, is your safety. Declaring that emergency gives you immediate priority from ATC. It's like having a whole team of people dedicated to getting you back on the ground safely. That may mean clearing out airspace, providing vectors, coordinating with emergency services. The bottom line is, if you're in a tough situation, you probably want all the help that you can get. And ATC is trained to do just that. I also want to talk about the mindset behind saying the E word. Many pilots worry about looking weak, or they just think they can rub some dirt on it. Or, But in aviation, we're a big team. If your gut is telling you something isn't right, trust your gut. And remember, it's far better to overreact and declare an emergency than underreact and end up in a potentially deadly situation. The Air Safety Institute has an accident case study called Final Approach. In that video, you'll see that a Piper Arrow went down near Dover Air Force Base in Delaware. And as you watch the video you'll see that the pilot probably hesitated on using that big airfield that was right in front of them because they didn't want to declare an emergency. Three miles from the end of runway 14 at Dover Air Force Base, a Piper Arrow glides silently through the clouds, propeller windmilling in the slipstream, its pilot searching desperately for the glow of runway lights through the gloom. Ma'am, I don't suppose there's any chance I can uh, land at Dover. Ten minutes later, and eight miles north of the base. Ma'am, I'm declaring an emergency here. I'm out of fuel. I am out of fuel and going down. Shortly thereafter, the aircraft collides with trees two miles off the end of the runway and crashes to an abrupt fatal halt. What would be the implication of a general aviation pilot declaring emergency and landing at a military airfield. And I think there's this fear that if you land at a military airfield, you're somehow going to be in trouble. To put it simply, that's not true. If we have a piece of concrete that works well for your airplane and you're in a situation where you need to get that airplane on the ground as soon as possible, then doing so at our airfield is something that we are going to absolutely help you uh, with. So I, I don't want any GA pilot you know, or civilian pilot as a whole to ever think that a military base is not going to uh, support them if they're dealing with a situation uh, where, where time is of the essence. And I just want to take a second to thank Major Helton and everyone at the Air Force for making this happen. I've got two more videos in this series about military aviation safety practices that we in general aviation can adopt as well. Stay tuned for that. Safe flying, everybody.